1 Samuel chapter 31. Now the Philistines fought against Israel. And the men of Israel fled from before the Philistines and fell down slain in Mount Gilboa. And the Philistines followed hard upon Saul and upon his sons. And the Philistines slew his sons, Jonathan, Abinadab, and Melchishua. These were Saul's sons. And the battle went sore against Saul. And the archers hit him. And he was sore wounded, very wounded, fatally wounded of the archers. Then, verse 4, said Saul to his armor bearer, or his bodyguard, we would say today, draw thy sword and thrust me through therewith, lest these uncircumcised Philistines come and thrust me through and abuse me. But his armor bearer, his bodyguard, would not do so, for he was very afraid. Therefore Saul took his own sword and fell upon it, committing suicide. When his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, He fell likewise upon his sword and died with Saul. So, verse 6, Saul died, and his three sons, and his armor bearer, and all his men that same day together. And when the men of Israel that were on the other side of the valley, and they that were on the other side of Jordan, saw that the men of Israel fled, and that Saul and his sons were dead, They forsook their cities and fled too, and the Philistines came and dwelt in those cities. It came to pass, verse 8, on the morrow, the next day, when the Philistines came to strip the slain, they found Saul and his three sons fallen on Mount Gilboa, and they cut off Saul's head, and they stripped off his armor, his clothing. And they sent into the land of the Philistines round about to publish it in the house of their idols and among their people. They sent his head from town to town, sharing the big news that Saul was taken down. Verse 10 says, They then took Saul's armor and put it in the house of Ashtaroth, their goddess of sexuality. Then they fastened Saul's body without its head, to the wall of Bet-Shan, one of the Philistine cities. Well, verse 11, when the inhabitants of Jabesh-Gilead, an Israelite town, these were Israelis or Israelites, when they heard that which the Philistines had done to Saul, hanging his naked, headless body, pinning it to the wall, All the valiant men, verse 12, arose, and they marched all night, and they took the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons from the wall of Bet-Shan, the Philistine city. And they came back to their town, Jabesh-Gilead, and they burnt the bodies there, unusual for a Jew. But the bodies were so abused that it was all that they could do. However, verse 13 says, but they took the bones the bones that weren't burned in the fire, and buried them under a tree at Jabesh and fasted seven days. Interesting, interesting story. We come to the end of the sad, sorry saga of Saul. Saul, king of Israel, the first king of the country, had tragically and stupidly hardened his heart against the Lord, turned his back on the Lord, and now was being judged by the Lord. We read, and I'll read it to you, in First Chronicles chapter 10, it tells what happened that day when Saul and his sons were killed. Saul died for his transgression, which he committed against the Lord, even against the word of the Lord, which he kept not. And also for asking counsel of one that had a demon spirit. You might recall the witch of Endor. We saw her last week. 
And he inquired not of the Lord. Therefore, the Lord slew him and turned the kingdom over to David, the son of Jesse. Saul, just like was prophesied by Samuel in the chapter previously, Saul, tomorrow you're going to die. You've rebelled against the Lord. You've turned your back on the Lord. You're going to be judged by the Lord. And now that day had come. Saul, his sons, his soldiers are there at Mount Gilboa battling against the Philistines. Saul sees his soldiers falling round about him like flies. The army was wiped out. He sees his sons going down right before him, and they would die, no doubt breaking his heart. And then he himself would feel the piercing pain of a Philistine arrow that was shot by an archer that found its target that day, and the life of Saul was draining from him. He knew that he was at the end. And he said to his bodyguard, his armor bearer, Kill me! I'm wounded fatally. Kill me, lest lest the Philistines come up here and abuse me terribly. The armor bearer wouldn't do it. And so Saul did that which was unethical, immoral, sinful, and he knew it. He killed himself, committed suicide. Why? Once again, he's taking things into his own hands. I don't want the Philistines to abuse me. So I'll take things into my own hands, even though God's word has made it clear that I'm not to do so. Hey, a man's got to do what a man's got to do. And that's the irony. Because in trying to keep himself from being abused, he would end up abused beyond his wildest imagination. His body was stripped of its clothing. His head was lopped off and passed around from city to city, the cities of the Philistines. And his naked corpse was nailed to the wall of a city to be a spectacle, the ultimate kind of degradation and humiliation, the very thing that Saul was seeking to avoid when he was taking things into his own hands as he was prone to do. Now, his corpse flies swarming round about, hanging there nakedly, people mocking, laughing, jeering, spitting, you see. (laughs) There's the king of Israel. Well, the story continues because when the men of Jabesh Gilead, an Israelite city, when they got word that Saul's corpse was pinned to the wall of a Philistine city, Their hearts were stirred with compassion. And these men risked their lives, these Israelites from Jabesh Gilead, and they marched all night, and they made their way to the Philistine city where Saul's body was pinned to the wall so grossly. And they rescued the body of Saul and Saul's sons too. And they brought the the corpse of Saul And the corpses of his sons as well, they brought the bodies to Jabesh Gilead, their town. So mutilated, so so gross were the bodies they had to burn them. But the bones, the bones were not burned in the fire and were buried under a tree. Now, interesting. What moved the men of Jabesh Gilead? Why would they risk their lives, take such a chance... March all night, outnumbered, outmanned, outgunned, but risk everything to to rescue a headless corpse of a judged king? Why would they do that? Ah, thereon hangs a tale. It's because of something that happened 40 years before this story in our text today. 40 years previously, When Saul was presented to Israel as their king, perhaps you recall the story. Certain people applauded 
Long live the king, they said. But others said, we're not going to have this hick, this farmer from the tribe of Benjamin rule over us. That's not the king we're looking for. He's not the guy that we want on the throne. And Saul realized that the opinion about him was divided. So he went back to his farm and farmed again, plowed away day after day. When suddenly, word came to him. Word came to Saul that the men of Jabesh-Gilead were in trouble. You see, Nahash, whose name means serpent or snake, he was an Ammonite. And he mobilized the Ammonites to wage war on the men of Jabesh-Gilead, that Israelite city. And the men of Jabesh-Gilead saw Nahash, the snake, and all of his boys out there and said, Hey, can we negotiate, please? Can we have a peace conference, Camp David, Y River, whatever it might be? Can we come together and and negotiate, please? Nahash said, here's the negotiation that we offer. Here's the peace plan that we're presenting. We will let you guys live if you allow us to poke out all of your men's right eyes. Why the right eye? Well, in so doing, by poking out the right eye, you incapacitate the men as soldiers. Because men in those days would carry the shield in their left hand that would cover this side of their body, their sword would be in their right hand, and they would peek around the shield, if you would, with their right eye. But if their right eye is gone, then you've got to go like this. And you can't, you know, how do you do, you can't see a thing. You're going to be dead meat in the battle, you see. We're going to poke out the right eyes of all your men. That's the deal. Well, these guys, they took a vote. And they were all nays and no eyes. And so they said, we don't want to do that. Pardon me. They said, would you... Would you mind giving us just seven days to see if we can get some help? (laughs) Go ahead, the snake said. Nobody's going to help you. Why did Nahash think that no one would help them? A couple of reasons. One, Nahash was like Muhammad Ali, just a cocky guy, quite frankly. Get any help you want, we'll take on anybody. But secondly... Nahash no doubt knew the history of Jabesh Gilead before that. What's that? One day in the book of Judges, we read there was a Levite who had a concubine. The concubine was raped brutally by a group of people in that region. And she died as she was raped to death. The Levite chopped up her body in 12 parts and sent her body throughout the 12 tribes saying, I've been wronged by my brothers, by Israelites. And all of the men of Israel, seeing this, this gross telegram of a, of a body part that came their way, said, hey, there's something wrong here. And they mobilized and got together and gave justice to the perpetrators of that rape murder. But there was one city that didn't show up. There was one group that didn't come, the men of Jabesh Gilead. So the other Israelites waged war against the men of Jabesh Gilead and really spanked them. Nahash would know that story. Nobody cares about you guys at Jabesh Gilead. Why? Hey, you're on the wrong side of the Jordan River. You're on the east side of the Jordan River. The people of Israel were all supposed to be on the west side. You that know your Bible history know about that. But some said, no, we don't want to cross over the Jordan and go into the promised land. We're happy on this side. You're on the wrong side of the Jordan River. Plus, they spanked you before because you wouldn't help them out in their war. Nobody's going to help you, Nahash thought. But Saul heard about it. And it says, Saul was moved with compassion and a righteous indignation. He takes a bull. He chops the bull up into 12 parts and sends a piece of the bull to the 12 tribes, similar to what the Levite did years before. 
And he said, if anybody doesn't join me in rescuing the men of Jabesh Gilead from the snake, the serpent Nahash, you're going to be like this bull, dead meat. You see, that's no bull, Loney. You come or you're going to be chopped up and taken apart. 330,000 men show up. And Saul marched all night with that massive army of 330,000 men. Marched all night to Jabesh Gilead up north on the east side of the Jordan River. And of course, delivered them, rescued them. These men, Jabesh Gilead, never forgot that. Forty years earlier, Saul marched all night to rescue them. When Saul could have said, I've got my own problems. The people don't even accept me as king. And, and, and those guys are way up there in the northern part, and they're on the wrong side of the river anyway. Hey, they made their bed. They didn't cross over the Jordan. And they have a history of being kind of troublemakers anyway. So, hey, let them sit there. Let them stew in the pot that they're in. But Saul didn't do that. As a young man, as a new king, not yet received by the nation, he mobilized the people and marched. And the men of Jabesh remembered it. And the Bible says in our text, the valiant men of Jabesh Gilead said, Now, Saul, 40 years later, he's in trouble. His body is pinned to the wall. And they're spitting on him, and they're making fun of him. And we're going to go and rescue his corpse. And that's what they did. Interesting, folks. Interesting. Because you, too, are like the men of Jabesh Gilead in this story. How so? You're valiant. What do you mean? You, too, have marched all night, or at least marched this morning, from Medford or Grants Pass or Northern California or wherever you've come from. You got in your car on a beautiful spring day when everybody else would say, why aren't you mowing your lawn or at the lake or doing something outside? But you made your way to here to do what we do day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. What's that? Like the men of Jabesh Gilead who were valiant, we remember. That's our king. We remember what he did for us 40 years ago. That's our king that's pinned to the tree, pinned to the wall. Decapitated, spat at, mocked, made fun of. He was the one that that rescued us, and we haven't forgotten. So we come here today because our king was pinned to the wall, pinned to a wooden cross, the tree called Calvary. Why? 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 He was worse than Saul. You say, but John, John, Saul was being judged by God. Saul was a man that that was rebellious and and disobeyed and went into witchcraft. And John, we've been studying his story. It's awful what Saul did. It's awful who Jesus was, our king. Huh? What are you saying? The Bible says he who knew no sin was made sin. Sin that we might be made the righteousness of God. He, Jesus, our king, took upon the sins of Saul, of Osama bin Laden, of Adolf Hitler, of you, of me too, the sins of all humanity through all History, he embodied it. He became sin. It was ugly what happened to him. And God the Father, even as he looked at Saul in Saul's rebellious, sinful condition and had to judge him, 
So now Jesus takes my sin, all of it, and yours too, and the sins of all humanity, and God judges his son himself. Jesus is pinned to the wall, naked. Not a shred of clothing on him. We have pictures in our Bibles or pictures in storybooks that show him suffering slightly. That's not what happened. The agony was unbelievable, and his humiliation was unspeakable as he hung there naked like Saul. They spat at Saul and made fun of Saul, so too with our king. We remember what our king did for us. He rescued me. My king rescued me. And I remember now, my king, my king who rescued me, my king who who rescued you too, our king. Now, others are, are forgetting about him, don't have time for him. But we see our king. That's why we're here, service after service, session after session, to say, this we do in remembrance of you, Lord. Naked, you were hanging on the wall, the tree of Calvary. Decapitated. What? I didn't know that. Yeah, he was decapitated. Spiritually. Where was his body? He's the head. His disciples, the body of Christ on that day when he was pinned to the wall, pinned to the tree. Where was his disciples? They had all run. There was separation. Only one, John, hung around. The rest all ran away. There was separation, the head and the body. There was humiliation. He hung there nakedly at, mocked, made fun of. He was the one that, that rescued us, and we haven't forgotten. So we come here today because our king was pinned to the wall. Pinned to a wooden cross, the tree called Calvary. Why? 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 He was worse than Saul. You say, but John, John Saul was being judged by God. Saul was a man that, that was rebellious and, and disobeyed and went into witchcraft, and John, we've been studying his story. It's awful what Saul did. It's awful who Jesus was, our king. Huh? What are you saying? The Bible says he who knew no sin was made sin that we might be made the righteousness of God. He, Jesus, our king, took upon the sins of Saul, of Osama bin Laden, of Adolf Hitler, of you, of me too, the sins of all humanity through all history. He embodied it. He became sin. It was ugly what happened to him. And God the Father even as he looked at Saul in Saul's rebellious, sinful condition and had to judge him. So now Jesus takes my sin, all of it, and yours too, and the sins of all humanity, and God judges his son himself. Jesus is pinned to the wall, naked. Not a shred of clothing on him. We have pictures in our Bibles or pictures in storybooks that show him suffering slightly. That's not what happened. The agony was unbelievable, and his humiliation was unspeakable as he hung there naked like Saul. They spat at Saul and made fun of Saul, so too with our king. We remember what our king did for us. He rescued me. My king rescued me. And I remember now, my king, my king who rescued me, my king who who rescued you too, our king. Now, others are, are forgetting about him, don't have time for him. But we see our king. That's why we're here, service after service, 
session after session to say, this we do in remembrance of you, Lord. Naked, you were hanging on the wall, the tree of Calvary. Decapitated. What? I didn't know that. Yeah, he was decapitated spiritually. Where was his body? He's the head. His disciples, the body of Christ on that day when he was pinned to the wall, pinned to the tree. Where was his disciples? They had all run. There was separation. Only one, John, hung around. The rest all ran away. There was separation, the head and the body. There was humiliation. He hung there nakedly. People mocked him, made fun of him. But interestingly enough, even though he was burned, the wrath of God, the fire of God's righteous indignation was poured out upon the sun. He took the heat. He took the hell for me. Yet, even as our story, this king, this Saul, in his saga, who became sin, rebellious, iniquitous, evil to the core, look at him, naked, headless, mocked, humiliated, burned, just like our king. But it says concerning Saul, they took his bones and they buried them. Our king, even though he hung on the cross and was beat up beyond recognition, it says not one of his bones was broken to fulfill the prophecy that was spoken previously. And they took Saul's burnt ashes. The bones were then pulled away and they took the bones and they buried the bones under a tree, we are told in our text. If you ever go to Jerusalem, I hope you do. If you ever go to Israel, I hope you can. You'll go to the garden tomb and you'll understand. Right there in the same place where he, Jesus, was pinned to the cross, pinned to the tree, He was buried, just a stone's throw away, under the shadow of the tree of the cross of Calvary. The tomb is right there, right next to where the cross on which he hung was located. It's an amazing thing to me. And you are these who we read in our story who say, others don't remember Others might not care. But I will come to the Lord's table time and again, week after week, day after day, morning by morning, to say, I remember. Your body was humiliated, separated, burned with the heat of of God's righteous indignation. Bones buried under the tree. That's you, Jesus. And I remember. And I am here to say thank you because, because, because the serpent, Nahash, was out to get me. Because the serpent, the snake, was saying, I'm going to blind you and keep you in a blinded, weakened condition all of your life. You're never going to have a successful fight. I'm going to see to it, Nahash said to me. The serpent, the snake, the devil said to you, to me, to us. I'm going to keep you blinded. I'm going to make you incapacitated. You're going to be in submission to me. And we were in big trouble, folks. Do you know that? You were in big trouble. You were blind as a bat, spiritually. And the snake was calling the shots and pulling your strings and manipulating you in ways that we didn't realize. We didn't have a clue. But our king, our king came to our rescue and said, enough of that. And mercy and compassion filled his heart. And he marches from heaven to earth to do battle in our place to take on the serpent, Nahash, and the Ammonites. What mercy, what grace. So here I am today. I'm always around here. You are too. To say, Lord, 
Others might not remember. Others might not care. But we of Jabesh Gilead remember what you did when you marched all night and came to this world to save us and how 43, 45, 47, whatever the number might be, years, days, or 40 seconds ago for someone, perhaps, when you finally see, the Lord did that for me. Yeah. Our king marched. Our king nailed to the wall. Our king humiliated that we might be forgiven and set free. Now listen. In light of that, what ought we to do? How ought we to be? Did you know our Lord Jesus, the, the, the master of mercy, our gracious king, our rescuer, he says to us, here's what I want you to do. Only three things the Lord ever said, I want you to learn. Only three times the Lord ever said, I want you to learn. One, Matthew 11, when he said, learn of me and you'll find rest in your souls. Two, Matthew 24, when he said, learn a parable of the fig tree, which deals with, as most of you know, Israel, Bible prophecy, the end times. Learn of me, learn of Israel and Bible prophecy. The third thing he said in Matthew chapter 9, now learn mercy. Learn what this means. I will have mercy, not sacrifice. See, here's the thing. This is what you got to know. This is what I want you to see before you pack up and go. Listen to me. Give me your attention. Tune in. Listen up. Take note. Saul, with all of his messy story, with all of his failures and foibles and flaws, which are innumerable, one thing he did do, he showed mercy to the men of Jabesh Gilead 40 years earlier. Jesus said this, mercy, learn this, get this, know this, study this, be schooled in this. Jesus said, blessed are the merciful for they shall, what? Obtain mercy. It'll come back. Even if you're as terrible as a Saul, (laughs) as messed up as he was, he was Merciful to the men of Jabesh Gilead. And now 40 years later, when he is naked and humiliated in a way that he didn't want to be, guess who shows him mercy? The men that he was merciful to. It comes back. In Luke chapter 6, Jesus said, don't you understand that, that whatever is measured out, it will be measured back to you. And he was talking about, in Luke 6, not money. He was talking about mercy. If you give out mercy, it'll be given back to you. Men will give to you. Pressed down, shaken together, running over, will men give to your bosom. What? If you are merciful, not critical, not cynical, not analytical, finding fault with Hmm, what does he mean by that, I wonder? (laughs) Or why did she say that? Hmm. Boy, may that be stripped from me and ripped from you. Because whatever you give out is going to come back, guarantee. If I choose, even if I'm as wrong as a Saul, if I choose to be merciful, Jesus said, be an expert in that because if you're merciful, you will obtain mercy when you need it, and you will. When you're exposed, and you're going to be. When you're off the wall, or on the wall, as is the case with Saul, you need mercy. It's going to come back. To whatever degree you gave out, it's going to come back. Blessed are the merciful. They shall obtain mercy. It might not happen right away. 
Don't expect a bonsai tree to grow the minute you're planting it. Folks, are you awake? (laughs) Don't expect a bonsai tree to grow the minute you're planting it. (laughs) A bonsai tree to grow the minute you're plant. Folks. Dom, would you explain it to Janice, please? Yes. <laughs> You're saying, what did he mean by that? <laughs> Don't expect the... Anyway. I showed mercy. Hey, it'll come back. It might not be the next day, but when you need it the most, there it'll be. Rooted. Grown. Covering. Shading you. Because you showed mercy. To who? Listen to what... Jesus said, learn mercy. Referring to Hosea 6, also to Micah 6, he has shown the old man what is good and what the Lord desires of you, but to what? Do justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with your God. Huh? Do justly. Yeah, I'm concerned about, no, you do justly. Not, why aren't they doing justly? Why isn't he doing justly? And why isn't she? No, it's, you do justly. You do what's just and right. Do justly and then love mercy. Everybody else gets mercy. I'm to do justly. I'm to live in the way that I know I'm supposed to. But then I'm to show mercy to everybody around me. To do justly. To love mercy. And to walk humbly with our God. Micah 6 8. Why? Because it'll come back to me. Why? Because I was shown so much mercy. I don't want to be like, like that lady with the big black Bible, the elderly gal with big Bible in her hand as she sat there on the bus. The bus stops and in comes a unkept, drunk man, kind of staggers down the aisle and plops right down next to her with her big black Bible. And she looks him up and down and smells the alcohol on his breath and sees that he's in sort of a drunken state and said, I've got news for you, mister. You are headed straight to hell. And he hears that and stands up and shouts out, Oh no, I'm on the wrong bus again. (laughs) (laughs) You're headed straight for hell, we say. You shouldn't act like that. Who do you think you are? Why are you up to that? Forget about it. Point the finger at yourself. Do justly. Love mercy. Why? It'll come back to you. Secondly, because God has been very merciful with me and you. Morning by morning, new mercies we see. We're the ones that are on the wrong side of the Jordan River, folks. We're the ones that are... The guys that didn't come to the fight like the men of Jabesh Gilead didn't when they were supposed to. We're the ones that should be forgotten about. We're the ones that should be kicked out. We're the ones that... But that's not what the Lord did with me. It's not what the Lord does with you. He marched to our rescue. So what do you say as we end this service? What do you say That we do what we did. We remember our king. And we'll march here time and time again. Or wherever the bread and the body are offered. Wherever the king is remembered. We'll be in that place constantly. Because we remember. Others might not, but we will. And secondly, and we'll go. Not only remembering what our king did, but repeating the lesson of mercy. Just to show mercy to everybody. 
because I'm going to need it. I know. And I am a constant recipient of it. I know. I'm going to be like the men of Jabesh Gilead. I'm going to be like Saul was in his better times, in his early days. Let's say we're going to be people of mercy.